We introduce, therefore, a mild acid such as acetic acid in the solution of sodium thiosulfate. This doesn't seem to be such a good idea, for the acid has decomposed the sodium thiosulfate, forming a colloidal suspension of sulfur. The reaction has also formed sodium sulfite. It is logical, therefore, that by adding a substantial quantity of sodium sulfite to the solution prior to the acetic acid, the decomposition can be prevented. Here are two solutions of sodium thiosulfate. Sodium sulfite is added to one of them. Now we see that the acetic acid will cause the plain hyposolution to sulfurize, while it does not affect the other containing the sulfite. It is also desirable that the fixing bath contain something that will harden the gelatin emulsion so that it may be dried readily, and so that the film when dry will not be easily scratched. For this purpose, potassium aluminum sulfate, or alum, is employed. The effect of the alum is demonstrated by this melting point test. One of the two strips of film on this wooden frame has been fixed in a plain hypo solution, whereas the other has been fixed in one containing potassium alum. As the water in the beaker is slowly heated, we note that the emulsion which has not been hardened melts away from the transparent film support, while the other remains attached. The ingredients of a fixing solution are therefore sodium thiosulfate, sodium sulfite, acetic acid, and potassium alum. These scenes show the darkroom operations of the laboratory in the old days. Film was handled manually, and the photographic quality was judged by eye. After loading a rack with film, it was developed in a small tank. If at first it wasn't right, dunk, dunk again. The only scientific apparatus used was a thermometer. In the summer, a little ice was added to the developer, and in winter, hot water was convenient. After fixing and washing in similar tanks, it was put up to dry, and the surplus moisture was removed by wiping it with a sponge. Prints from the negative onto a positive film were made by exposing each little frame of picture, one by one, on a slow machine such as this one. Automatic precision control is the keynote of the modern laboratory. These instruments continuous records of operating conditions such as relative humidity, air and water temperatures, and generator voltage. Developing solution temperatures are controlled to within one-tenth of a degree. To keep air in solutions at the proper temperatures, enormous refrigerating machines are required. This one has a daily cooling capacity equal to 250 tons of ice. Even the storage of film is under controlled conditions. Vaults is kept cool and is provided with automatic sprinklers for fire prevention. In a modern laboratory, quality is not left to human judgment but is controlled by scientific methods. For example, developers are maintained by tests in the chemical laboratory. By the use of special apparatus, the elon and hydroquinone concentration of developers may be measured, and the developer kept up to strength by the addition of the necessary chemicals. The analyst here makes a sample of the developer acid and allows ether to bubble through the sample. This ether extracts the unoxidized hydroquinone from the sample, and the solution collected in the graduate is then titrated with iodine. One of the most important characteristics of processing solutions is their pH value. The analyst is here measuring the pH of a developer by means of a meter with a glass electrode. The pH of a typical fixing bath is maintained at 4.5 by acetic acid. 
A negative developer is kept at 8.5 by the use of borks, and a positive developer has a pH of 10, maintained by sodium carbonate. These values must be held within close limits. The photographic characteristics of the films are measured by means of these film strips. A series of increasing exposures are made on an instrument called a sensitometer, and after processing, a series of increasing densities can be seen. These correspond to the different tones of gray in an actual picture, ranging from white to black. The degree of blackness or density is measured on a photoelectric cell densitometer. Since the densities vary directly as a logarithm of the exposures, it is possible to plot a curve which is valuable as a means of control. The slope of the curve is a measure of the photographic contrast, or the difference between light and dark tones of the picture. The curve on the right corresponds to low contrast, as shown in the following picture, which is soft and flat having too little difference between the tones. This one is too contrasty and is harsh, showing too much difference between the tones. And here is a picture correctly processed which shows a proper rendering of light and shade. After each day's shooting, the negative film exposed in the camera is delivered to the laboratory. While these pictures were made with bright lights, undeveloped film is actually handled under dim safe lights. In a modern laboratory, film is handled in a continuous strand passing over rollers. In order to visualize how the film travels through a developing machine, imagine this apparatus completely submerged in a developing solution. And here we see film actually being developed in the continuous machine. The film is traveling at approximately 100 feet a minute. The developer is pumped through stainless steel pipes from a large circulation tank. The developer is maintained in strength by replenisher added to this tank. After development, the film passes into the hypo compartment where the unexposed silver bromide is removed. All solutions are constantly filtered to ensure cleanliness, and here the fixing bath is being recirculated through cloth filters. The surplus silver from the film naturally collects in the hypo solution, and here it is being removed electrically. The silver plates out on large stainless steel cathodes and is thereby recovered. After developing and fixing, the film is washed to remove the chemicals. In a modern laboratory, even the wash water is filtered in a huge filter such as this. The film is now dried, and here we see the process negative emerging from the darkroom into a current of warm, dry air. Note the sensitometric strips processed with it for control. And here is the finished negative, a permanent record of what the cameraman saw but only a means to an end. The next operation in the laboratory is to make a positive print from this negative. The first step is to clean the negative, passing it through velvet, saturated with carbon tetrachloride. How do you tell what printing exposure to give the positive film? This man, known as a timer, is estimating the correct exposure from test strips each scene in the negative is printed on a short length of positive on a machine which gives a number of different exposures, varying from light to dark. By examining these tests, the timer is able to assign a correct printing value for each scene. These values are expressed in terms of printer lights, since the printing machines can be adjusted to provide different light intensities or exposure values. These test strips are moved up and down until the timer selects a particular frame that looks neither too light nor too dark. The different intensities are obtained on the printer by means of an automatic mechanism, which takes its cue from a tape punched like a player piano roll.
Here is the printer which exposes both picture and sound negative onto the positive film. We have not complicated this story by a discussion of sound recording. Suffice it to say that a negative film of the sound is obtained simultaneously with the picture. And here the two meet to make a composite print. The raw positive is threaded over the sprockets in such a manner that it comes in contact first with the picture negative and then with the sound. At each point of contact, light of the proper intensity exposes the negative record onto the positive film. And here are the finished prints. The sound wave patterns lie between the picture and the left hand perforations. Today, film is actually processed in one continuous strand. Splices do have to be made between rolls, however, on a splicing machine as shown here. So that the continuous process will not have to stop for this, the elevator on the left stores up film like a reservoir, filling when the film runs free and emptying when the flow is interrupted for a splice. These scenes show the operation of a continuous processing machine in which the positive film is exposed, developed, fixed, washed, dried, and inspected without interruption. Here it comes in momentary contact with the picture negative for the printing exposure. Now the photographic record of the sound is printed. The films travel through these machines at a speed of 175 feet a minute. And immediately after printing, the exposed positive passes directly into the developer. This scene is of different design from the one previously shown, but operates in a similar manner. The operator inspects the film in the machine to make sure that the film is riding properly on the rollers, using a dim flashlight made safe by a red glass. After washing, the surplus moisture is removed by an air jet and the film passes into a drying cabinet. A countercurrent of conditioned, dust-free air passes through the cabinet, drying the film. The back of the film passes over drums of white cloth, which remove any water spots which may have formed during drying. After drying, the film is inspected by actual projection and is then ready to be shipped to the theaters. An arc light shining through a lens projects the succession of tiny pictures on the screen and the finished product of Hollywood is presented for your entertainment. While the ancient alchemist failed in his search for the philosopher's stone, which would enable him to convert baser metals into gold, the alchemist in Hollywood has found the philosopher's stone in a tiny crystal of silver bromide. With millions of these crystals, he converts these lifeless rolls of motion picture film into the golden miracle of romance, education, entertainment.